Thank you to the AHSC team for inviting me to give this talk and to share a little bit of the work that we're doing in the mental health arena. Um, I'm focusing particularly on that that will be that meets the brief about what, what do we know about what helps and what works uh, for mental health um, for children and young people. Um, I'm giving you this talk from my NHS clinic, um, because as well as being an academic at Imperial on a daily basis, I'm an eating disorders child and adolescent psychiatrist, so that will feature a little bit in my uh, presentation. Uh, but increasingly, I've become interested in population um, mental health. Um, in order to catch people earlier and address some of the risk factors that we know apply across um, children and young people. Um, uh, what, what helps young people be happy and healthy? Um, the Royal College of Psychiatrists has a, a, a motto, no health without mental health. Um, in other words, that you can be as physically well as possible uh, and, and all can be well from a physical point of view, but if your mental health isn't isn't help, isn't good, um, then that's going to affect everything that you do. In other words, good mental health underpins all sense of well-being. Um, luckily, I didn't need to do the research um, about what makes young young people happy. Children's views on well-being were part of a, a um, qualitative piece of research undertaken by the Office of Nas National Statistics in 2020. Um, and uh, this was a qualitative analysis of children and young people's views on their well-being and what makes for a happy life. And the unsurprising findings, um, I think, are just important to, to um, touch on. And I've highlighted some of the key words here. So the number one is always feeling loved. Um, and supported by positive relationships. And that means family and friendship. And that's at the heart of what we do in child psychiatry, um, but it's also a, a feature of some of our research. And I'll come on to talk about the research we're doing in each of these spaces in a minute. Feeling safe at home, in your neighborhood, and at school and online. And that must be a new addition, of course. Children being able to be themselves and express themselves without being judged. Um, the schools that they, they spend a huge proportion of their time in school, school must be a good place. And that means physically a place where it doesn't feel um, shabby and uh, neglected, but also that it's stimulating and there are opportunities and they get support from staff, as well as, of course, it being a social um, uh, context for the making of friendships. Family finances and socioeconomic factors feature from children's perspective. If their family is struggling socially, they will be struggling. Um, and, and that's not just about money, it's also about community, about social inclusion. And finally, the last one that they highlight was uh, living in a country at peace and where their needs are considered. Um, I am not going to promise you world peace, um, much though I would like to. Um, but uh, I think the last point is one wor well worth picking up, because in addition to all the usual challenges that children and young people have had um, or have growing up and all the developmental tasks they need to cut overcome, um, like the rest of us, they have just lived through a huge um, um, a pandemic which has had a huge impact on their lives and in which I think many people would say and I'm certainly one of them that has been disproportionate in the um, way that it's affected children and young people disproportionate in the sense of the risk to themselves being relatively low but the impact on them being very high and yet you may, may or may not be surprised to know that when the government originally set out the scope of the COVID inquiry to look at the impact of COVID, they excluded children and young people. Um, and um, that's now thankfully been overturned due to uh, a group of us writing um, uh, in, in ways we hope we think have been influential um, about the fact that this was a real oversight. So children still need adults to advocate on their behalf. I'm going to touch briefly on the impact of the pandemic because I think the pandemic has really brought mental health into the forefront um, to the extent that everybody's talking about it as the second pandemic. Um, the, uh, if anyone who's really interested in the impact of the pandemic on mental health, I'll refer you to the Depressed Project, which is what's known as a living systematic review, 
which means that in real time they are they are synthesizing all of the publications about the impact of COVID on mental health. I'm not going to go into that in great detail, but what I do want to highlight is that out of nearly 3,000 papers, only just over 200 are considered high enough quality to add real scientific knowledge, and of these only 18 are about children and young people. One of those 18 is from the UK. We have one really good high quality study on a representative sample. And what that found that some of you may already know is that rates of probable mental disorder increased following the pandemic. You can see on the right to where about one in six young people have a diagnosable, a potential diagnosable mental disorder. Um, and um, that, that, once, that that plateaued between 2020 and 21. Um, that uh, some people experienced significant deterioration, but some people actually improved. So for some people being not having to go to school and being in, um, in their in family, family environment was helpful. And that's an interesting finding that it's not a one size fits all um, uh, outcome. And my particular area of expertise is eating disorders. And there we saw a particularly high increase in the number of people with eating disorders during the pandemic. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but the last uh, thing from the Depressed Project is that of 83 studies looking at interventions, and this seminar is mainly about interventions and what implementing what we know, only one has been on children and young people. Now, part of the reason for that is it takes a while for research to move from research into practice. Um, so I'm going to tell you about quite a few studies that we're involved in, which are still in the idea stage or still in the this is what's going to happen stage. So apologies for that, but, um, but where there are publications, I will obviously tell you about them. So just picking up on some of those themes about what children and young people think are happy. Um, in terms of relationships with family, um, my PhD student, Cecily, um, is working on something called mentalization or reflective function. Now, reflective function is a construct um, originated by Peter Fonagy. He's a psychotherapist. Um, and it's to do with the ability to reflect and think about yourself and others, mental states and well-being. Um, it's another word for psychological mindedness, in other words, to kind of be able to think what's happening, what's going on for that person that's not directly to do with me and what's, um, what am I thinking and feeling about this. As you can imagine, it's quite an important construct for interpersonal relationships. If you don't, if you can't put yourself in someone else's shoes, you're likely to get it wrong quite a lot. And um, there's emerging literature in quite a number of fields across mental health about the importance of reflective functioning um, in, uh, in outcomes for mental health uh, and as a kind of core, core feature of some mental disorders. And it's become a target for some therapy, therapies. So there are some reflective function focused therapies. And more recently, this has moved into the eating disorders field with some work by Tom Jewell and colleagues um, about the importance of mentalization as predictors of outcome from family therapy for adolescent anorexia nervosa. So Cecily's work is following on from Tom Jewell's work to find out whether reflective functioning, young people's ability to reflect on their situation from a psychological perspective and on others changes during treatment for an eating disorders. And does that relate to how well they do in treatment? And then this is something I think is really important. Can we improve parental reflective function? So the ability of parents to think about their child from a psychological perspective and does, the help their, does, does that help their child? And we've got evidence of that from other fields, but not yet in the eating disorders field. And so she's doing this by looking at the impact of a brief intervention for parents that I developed and manualized a few years ago and that we've, de um, that we've demonstrate uh, does impact outcome. Um, and we're now looking at what the mechanism is by which that um, improves uh, outcome. And then the final study is a very ambitious study um, on uh, hundreds, I mean, I mean nearly a thousand young people in the general population to see whether reflective function relates to their risk of disordered eating or indeed whether the positive uh, being good at reflective function is a protective factor against the development of eating disorders. And that's important because we're looking constantly for things that might um, we might be able to enhance in young people to protect them against mental health problems, particularly in early adolescence and at that time of uh, heightened social and emotional learning. The other piece of research that we're doing around relationships um, is being led by my postdoc, uh, Victoria Burmester. Her expertise is in oxytocin. 
you might have heard about oxytocin. It's sometimes known as the love hormone um, because it's particularly associated with bonding, mother-child bonding particularly. But it does have other effects as well. And it reduces, so for example, it reduces social anxiety and it improves empathy. And you can imagine that that therefore might be quite helpful in people who are struggling with interpersonal difficulties, particularly during adolescence. Um, because, uh, because adolescence is a critical peer, a time for making relationships, beginning to move away from relationships relationships within the family to um, peer relationships and being able to establish your first important intimate relationships. Um, and so the research that she's doing at the moment, which is funded by the Rose Trees Foundation, is to, is to try and work out what proportion of young people with eating disorders have these social and interpersonal difficulties. We know they're there. There's been lots of literature um, talking about uh, interpersonal difficulties as triggers. There's an increasing literature about people um, with autism spectrum being at higher risk for eating disorders. Um, but we don't really know how many of the young people that we see across the country this applies to. And for this, we are collating data from literally thousands of young people's contact contacts within eating disorder services across the country. Um, then we want to ask young people and parents, because all of the research we do, we involve the people that it involves. We want to think, what do they think about the idea of oxytocin as a treatment alongside psychological and talking therapies? And then particularly, and this is getting a bit technical, um, but some of you may be interested, is um, what aspects of interpersonal functioning does oxytocin particularly affect? Is it sensitivity to being rejected, which is something that young people, adolescents talk about a lot clinically? Um, is it negative interpretation bias? That's something that's the tendency to th see things in a negative way. Or is it social anxiety, as I, as I mentioned? So that's what uh, Victoria's um, work is about. And she's just undertaken the first adolescent oxytocin intervention studies um, to our knowledge um, in this field. Feeling safe um, I'm going to touch on from the opposite thing, opposite end, which is what do people do when they're not feeling safe? They tend to go, and we saw this a lot during the pandemic, to the emergency department. And we don't know exactly how many young people were um, went to the emergency department with a mental health crisis during the pandemic as yet. But the figures you can see underneath are what we know about urgent admission, uh, urgent eating disorders presentations. So on the left column, you can see the number of urgent referrals to community eating disorder services. And on the right, you can see what happened to admissions, hospital admissions for people with eating disorders, children and young people, this is. Um, so uh, my team in the ARC um, did what we always do, which is to say, what do we already know about models of integrated care for young people, integrated physical and mental health care for people who present with mental health relation, related emergencies um, and, um, system, and systematically review the literature in that area. Um, and then they looked at the data that we have in our whole systems integrated care database um, to see how many young people this applied to in Northwest London. And here you can see um, that where there were probably over 3000 uh, mental health related emergency visits in Northwest London per year. Um, and you can see on the right um, that, that uh, the majority of those are related to mental health, mental disorders, um, and quite a lot to various forms of self harm, intentional or overdose. And this uh, relates to um, an, a really important work um, that we're doing in the ARC and um, where I'm overseeing the evaluation of a new model of care. And we're very excited that we've got people from NHS England coming to our first learning collaborative about this new model of care uh, in, a, in a few weeks time, because it's a new model of care that we hope will be implementable across the country. And to do that, we are undertaking a, a complex evaluation so that we can describe exactly what's happening in this new model of care, um, which includes within it uh, an integrated mental health, physical health, teaching and training and a pathway through from emergency care through to community care for mental health. Um, I said that we don't know how much mental health presents in acute settings, and because we don't, the NHR have funded this MAPS study, which I'm also involved with, which is about mental health admissions to paediatrics wards. And this is to quantify how many acute paediatrics um, admissions are due to mental health um, 
uh, for mental health reasons and what happens to those young people? What are the factors that influence the decision to admit to a paediatric ward and to talk to the young people and the families who are experiencing this care and use all of this information together to try and make recommendations for best practice because we know that paediatric wards are seeing a huge amount of the mental health burden of young people today. And we really want to make sure that the care they receive in those paediatric settings is optimized. Um, and then feeling happy in school. Um, so uh, there was a study undertaken a few years ago, just before the pandemic, um, but Chris, but Chris Bennell and Russell Viner at, at University College London, which was a, what's known as a whole school intervention. So training the whole school, um, setting up systems in a whole school to reduce bullying and aggression. And what they found was that in addition to reducing bullying and aggression, it has seemed to have a positive effect on children and young people's mental health. Now, that may not be a surprise, given what I've said, um, but the question that we then posed was, can this intervention known as learning together be adapted to improve mental health even more? And so we now have funding from the NIHR um, to examine that question. At the moment, it's a feasibility study. It's just been started. Um, but to do that, we had to come up with a theory. And I haven't got time to go through the detail of this, but myself and Stephen Scott, who's another child psychiatrist, were asked to come up with what's known as a logic model for how might a school environment influence a student health outcome? And what are the steps in between? What are the key interventions along the pathway that we hypothesize might make a difference to um, health outcomes? And so that's a study that we hope will, will be scaled up into a larger randomized control trial at a later date. And the other thing we're doing in schools is we've developed an app to help young people track and monitor their own mental health. Um, we hope by developing our own tool that we can then adapt this as a data collection platform for a whole series of studies. Um, so that's just a feasibility trial that we're collecting data from and recruiting schools for right now through our schools research network. Um, and then finally, um, equal access for all is a key topic. And this is a, a piece of work that we got NIHR funding for, which is about building infrastructure to assess children and young people's mental health, to um, enhance children and young people's mental health research, and particularly to assess the impact of health inequalities on access to and benefit from digital interventions as an interface between public health and clinical care. Um, and that will involve uh, assessing need for um, mental health interventions, particularly targeting areas of high unmet need, and then signposting to tailored digital evidence based interventions that have been developed as part of the best for you platform. Um, and then the, uh, the team want to assess who uses these interventions. It's all very well having interventions, but if they're not used, they're not terribly useful. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour. Here's some of the research team uh, that I work with and I'm gonna end now and thank you. Um, please do send in your questions. <laughs>